Onions have been around as part of our diets for well over 5,000 years of recorded history. But we're pretty certain our ancestors are even eating wild onion varieties in prehistoric times. It's by far the most emotional of all the vegetables, bringing tears to the eyes of cooks around the globe. But it's also had a long and storied history throughout the ages, showing up in ancient texts from China to Greece to the Roman Empire. In more modern times, it's been used in a variety of non-cooking based methods on battlefields across multiple wars. It just might be nature's most versatile product and forms the basis of a vast array of cuisines across the globe. Today, we're going to be diving into some stories about the humble onion that by the end of it may just have elevated it to new and greater heights. Welcome to the fantastic history of food. Strange but true stories from history that in some way involve food. I'm your host, Nick Charlie Key. Archaeologists, botanists, and food historians throughout the ages have come to believe that onions first originated somewhere in Central Asia. Alternative research points more towards the Middle East, specifically Iran and West Pakistan. But wherever it came from, it has truly taken the world by storm. Our ancestors are believed to have foraged for and eaten the wild onion varieties long before societies moved towards farming and agriculture. As they were eaten and spread by the nomadic people groups, they began to grow all along the earliest migratory routes of the ancient peoples. At some point in time, as the nomadic people settled into more permanent societies, onions were one of the first crops to be domesticated and farmed on a semi-large scale. They were a favorite choice of agriculture, as they were incredibly hardy, less perishable than other vegetables, and could be carried and transported long distances without spoiling. In addition to this, they were fairly easy to grow. They could thrive in a variety of different soils and had a fairly broad range of tolerable climates. They could be dried and preserved for later consumption, or they could be used to prevent dehydration. And according to all of the texts that mention them, they were incredibly important and valuable to every culture that cultivated them. There are stories and ancient legends from a Native American tribe called the Western Mono who inhabited the pine forests along the Sierra Nevada mountain range in what is modern day California. It's a beautiful origin story of a specific section of the cosmos. The story tells of a group of six wives from the tribe who had gone out gathering food one day. While they were out, they found and snacked on some wild onions. Upon returning to their homes, their husbands were horrified by their pungent onion breath and all six of the wives were told to leave their homes until their breath returned to normal. After a while, the men began to miss their wives and, feeling lonely, went out together to look for the woman. But it was too late. The woman had wandered off into the sky to eat their onions in peace, and in doing so, had become the six-star cluster known today as the Pleiades. In ancient Egypt, onions were at one time an object of worship, with its many layers symbolizing heaven hell, earth, and as the layers went on and on, it also symbolized eternal life. In fact, the pharaoh, King Ramesses IV, was buried with onions in each of his eye sockets. It was a common motif of the time on funereal tombs to have images of priests blessing onions and laying their leaves and roots at an altar. In contrast, the religious leaders of the day also believed that onions were a powerful aphrodisiac and could incite desire in anyone who consumed them. Needless to say, these religious leaders stayed well clear of consuming these powerful alliums themselves. Ironically, however, the ubiquity of onions in Egypt even shows up in the Bible as the Israelites lament their exodus in the wilderness and their frustration with only eating manna. Numbers 11 verses 4 to 6 reads as follows. They began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat! We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. It seems that onions were so good, they were apparently even better than the Israelites' memory of having been the Egyptians' slaves.
going back across the globe to ancient China now, and we see that just like in the Egyptian mythology, the Chinese also believed that onions had a strong link to the afterlife. In their mythos though, onions were believed to have magical properties that could ward off evil spirits from the underworld. So they would hang onions above their doors and windows so the spirits couldn't enter their homes. In times of sickness or disease, when it was believed that a spirit was the cause of the illness, they would consume large quantities of raw onion as a way to drive the spirit out. In another case of accidentally doing something for one reason that works for a totally different reason, nutritional data actually backs up this practice. Onions are rich in vitamin C, which strengthens our immune systems, as well as selenium, which then stimulates that now strengthened immune system to function at its optimum levels. This cycle tends to reinforce the magical properties of pre-modern medicinal cures. In the ancient Greek Olympics, onions seem to have been used as a form of doping. Before events, in order to increase the athlete's strength and courage, they were fed large quantities of onions and were made to drink raw onion juice as both a thirst quencher and a body fortifier. Honestly, that sounds so incredibly bleak, but it seemed to function like an ancient Greek equivalent of Red Bull. Then, as if filling your insides with onions weren't enough, Athletes would then massage their whole bodies with onions and onion juice in order to toughen up their skin and get them ready for the coming events. Once again, it seems that the Greeks may have been onto something, as onions do in fact have anti-inflammatory qualities. They help to slow down oxidative damage to cells, and they also protect against heart disease. It would seem that onions, despite modern day attempts to push a myriad of other berries or vegetables, have been the real superfood all along. In fact, a more recent folk remedy suggests using onions as a cure for the common cold. Now, I'm sure from what I've just been telling you about the benefits of consuming onions that this would make perfect sense, right? Well, for some reason, this particular cure involved not eating the onions, but rather cutting two thick slices and then taping them to the soles of your feet before going to bed. Onions were at one time so popular and sought after that they became a form of currency in the Middle Ages. They were highly prized and valued accordingly, and so when people couldn't pay their rent, they would often substitute onions as their payment. On top of this, it became a popular gift for the newly married couples, both for their value as a gift, but also because of the aforementioned belief that onions acted as an aphrodisiac. And as if all we've heard about the magical healing properties of onions isn't enough, their juices also happen to be a mild antibiotic. In fact, in the American Civil War, onion juices were routinely used to treat the soldiers' gunshot wounds. It had become such an important part of the battlefield treatment regimen that during the war, when his supply of onions was running low, General Ulysses S. Grant sent an angry letter to the War Department in Washington saying simply, I will not move my troops without onions. So vital were he and his men to the war effort that within a few days they'd sent him three entire train cars full of onions. And this was not the first time that General Grant had wanted for onions in the war, as it shows up in his correspondence from November the 1st, 1862, when he sent a telegraph saying, I wish for a supply of potatoes, onions, whiskey, and beer. It is absolutely necessary that these articles should be had. Because, you know, the four staples of war are potato, onions, whiskey, and beer. Onions and their close relatives garlic were also used in the First and Second World Wars for their medicinal properties. In fact, modern research once again backs up their usage as it shows that garlic juice, for example, inhibits streptococcus, the bacteria behind pneumonia and scarlet fever, staphylococcus, which can cause severe skin rashes as well as vomiting and diarrhea, and it can also act as a preventative agent against typhus and dysentery, a soldier's worst nightmare. In general, onions have played such a central role in the history of humanity that it's hard to imagine living without them. Nowadays, they are essential components of so many different cuisines around the globe that if we removed all the recipes that included onions somewhere in the recipe, we'd probably wipe out half of the dishes on earth. In fact, onions can be so delicious that there is even a story of an 18th century French caterer who, faced with hungry customers and nothing in the way of protein to serve them with, served up a pair of soft leather gloves, shredded and sautéed with onions, mustard and vinegar. The diners, 
apparently asked for seconds. When the first European settlers made their way across to the Americas, onions were one of the few crops they took with them. When they arrived, they were also pleasantly surprised to find that there were a myriad of wild onions growing all over the place. One of the main places they discovered these wild onions were all along the banks of a particular river. Now the area had already been named by one of the native tribes, which in the Algonquin language was pronounced Shikakwa. This word meant either striped skunk or simply onion. Needless to say, it was probably less to do with the objects and more to do with the fact that both of those things emitted a rather pungent smell. It wasn't until explorer Robert de la Salle wrote about the area and misrecorded it as Chicago that we first got what would become the anglicized version of the name we know today, Chicago. So, for any of my listeners who call that city home, I'm sorry to tell you that apparently you live in stinky skunk onion town. Hey, don't shoot the messenger. Now in the 1800s, there was a small British territory, an island just over 20 square miles in size, that had an enormous reputation for producing one particular crop, Bermuda onions. That's right, the tiny island of Bermuda was at one time known for being the world's foremost onion producing region. So much so that the island had garnered the nickname, the Onion Patch. By 1844, the island was growing almost 350,000 pounds of onions per year, almost all of which was marked for foreign export. Sailors and merchant seamen from Bermuda even became known as the Onion Men. In 1877, Mark Twain visited the island and was so enamored with the onions that he found there that he wrote of them, The onion is the pride and joy of Bermuda. It is her jewel, her gem of gems. In her conversations, her pulpits, her literature, it is her most frequent and eloquent figure. In Bermudian metaphors, the onion stands for perfection. Perfection absolute. Now, what made the Bermuda onion more desirable than other varieties had almost everything to do with long voyage sailors. Onions, in general, were a great foodstuff to take on board ships, as they kept way better than other fruits and vegetables, and because of their high vitamin C content which was a great way to combat scurvy. But what made the Bermuda onion stand out in particular though, was that it was not like the generic onions we know today. They were in fact sweet enough to eat raw, meaning they could be snacked on throughout the day without having to have the ship's cook fry them up first. But even though this was a community that was so enraptured with the onion, it wasn't long before this once coveted crop began to disappear, almost into virtual obscurity. They were pushed out of the market by the vast land masses available to the settled farmers in Texas and Georgia. When the US, who had been the biggest importer of the Bermuda onions, began looking inward for their own supply, subsequently slapped a hefty import tax on foreign onions as well. And this became the death knell for Bermuda's onion trade. By the end of the First World War, the Texan onion trade was booming and Bermuda's was virtually non-existent. One final slap in the face was a Texan colony renaming their town Bermuda, Texas, so that they could still technically sell their onions as Bermuda onions. Nowadays, we don't worry too much about where our onions come from, and to tell you the truth, I have no idea about mine, but I'm definitely more curious now, and I guess with my fresh produce in general. But at the very least, the next time I'm wiping tears from my eyes as I slice into an onion to accompany that night's dinner, I'll remember that I'm just the latest in a long line of humans, stretching back thousands and thousands of years, who are all connected by the common thread of eating this multi-layered and much storied bulb. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fantastic History of Food. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at Food History Pod. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you taking a moment to rate the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. 
and if you can, leave a review as well. I also have a Patreon account where you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, bonus episodes, and even the chance to choose the topic for an upcoming episode. But all of this is only for our Patreon subscribers. Everyone who donates or subscribes will also get a personal shout out from me on an upcoming episode. Check out our website where you can find transcripts, show notes, and references for each and every episode at foodhistorypodcast.com.